The name is Savory, David Savory, and as one of Her Majesty's forefront domestic electricianists, one is oftentimes required to assume the function of what our American cousins may term as private dick. Indeed, deducing the answer to the kind of electrical mystery that would but perplex the likes of no other than Scotland Yard's finest is the very remedy to rise one's own gentleman to attention of a morning. <coughs> and I present to you here today just such a mystery, so dastardly in its execution that I don't doubt my old adversary, the Moriarty Electrical Power and Light Company, to be behind the foul deed. But enough of this preamble, the game is afoot. And to relate the tale, I must once more engage the assistance of my faithful companion, the venerable Dr. Twatson. Fuck off. And so our story begins on a normal Monday morning. Ensconced in my study and deep in thought was I regarding the machinations of Professor Moriarty and how his company vouchsafed their competent person's accreditation, when suddenly... Twatson, disengage from your attempt at providing my oral gratification. Your moustaches are unpleasantly velcroing to the very hairs upon the exterior of my pubis. Hey. Besides, I deduce that an important emailogram is to be delivered imminently to the Gmailoscope. Furthermore, I deduce that said correspondence is from a woman of passionate temperament, such as is found in the blood of the Italians, or perhaps even our Spanish cousins. Extraordinary! But how can you be sure of such detail? Elementary, my dear Twatson, for you see that the newfangled smart timepiece I have here has already received and decoded said communique, thus alerting me to its delayed but imminent arrival upon the desktop computing engine set afore me. I also took the advantage to observe said message has been authored in such an emotive way as only a passionate woman from continental shores would deign to use. For one can plainly tell, it is not the penmanship of a gentleman, especially with the love heart balloons displayed in the auto signature. Nor is it the parlance of an English lady, as the grammar and structure betray the Queen's tongue to be unfamiliar as the first language of the author. Fuck you now. Uh, quite, Twatson, quite. Observe, for it now arrives and displays upon the electronic looking glass set atop the writing bureau. If you'll permit me to recite the narrative, Twatson, we may be so enlightened as to the plight of this individual and how we may render our assistance. Sir, I entreat upon you to make haste to Merde Manor on the old Warwick Road at your earliest convenience, to investigate a matter of the utmost urgency regarding the lighting dimming apparatus in the drawing room, the operation of which sends quite the most upsetting and unwanted tingling sensation throughout one's person upon contact with the adjustment knob. Do hurry, for I fear foul play is afoot, and I can no longer trust other electricianists who lay claim to this perhaps being of evil influence or intent from no less than the very spirit world itself. Why, the mere thought of knob twiddling now makes one quite a faint. I am, sir, at your mercy. Pray put my mind at rest. The other electricianists whose services I have engaged on the matter have quite pissed me off with their inability to solicit a resolution. Your sincerely, Signora Scheitola. Egad. Twats and all, man. Do you know what this means? I don't have to brush my tongue. Uh, not quite, dear boy, for you're not finished down there after all. I need some time to think before we hail a handsome cab to take us to the scene of this alleged paranormal electrical incident. <coughs> don't talk with your mouth, or Twatson. And don't rush things for heaven's sake. The handsome will wait for us. It's not a fucking Uber. Jolly well, keep those teeth to one side, man. No, this means I was right about our client being of Mediterranean descent. For you see, Martha is a word of Latin entomology, and the closing sentence expressing the lady's evident annoyance quite betrays the hot blood of the Italian. This may be incidental to our case, however, and certainly adjusting the light level of any given room should not be causing physical tremulations of the nervous system for any one of the fairer sex. We do indeed have a mystery to solve here, Twatson. So, Carter man, we must be on the move before evensong. Once Twatson had rinsed out his beard, we flagged down our handsome. Coachman, pray make haste. Spare not the whip. Yar! <laughs> On the way, I took the opportunity to consult my street atlas. From our base, we were to travel to the house of the good lady at this location. It could be no coincidence that travelling south on the parallel track and equidistant to the location was the Moriarty Power and Light Company headquarters. Twatson, I believe I can see a pattern developing here. If only I could get a firm grip on it, I could perhaps deduce what all this means. 
I regret we were refused permission to utilise the cine recorder upon arrival at Marite Manor, as the lady of the house was already distressed by the incident and did not wish us to commit our findings onto photographic plate nor wax cylinder. Visual aids have thus been prepared to furnish the audience with illustration of the gruesome truth Twatson and I uncovered, that is, if you, the good viewer, have constitution hardened enough for it. Both Twatson and I examined the brassware of the switching apparatus, and we surmised that the circuit protective conductor connected to the metal switch plate, and which was supposed to be bonded back to our Mother Earth, was indeed not satisfactorily affixed in the manner that the venerable manufacturer of said switch plate had intended. Rather, we suspected that this was indeed the diabolical work of the Moriarty Electrical Power and Light Company, those fiends and their charlatan ways that eschew the very spirit of the third edition of the general rules recommended for wiring for the supply of electrical energy, those caddish, ungallant motherfuckers. But one must not allow oneself to be overridden by emotion. As a man of science, I was pleased to be able to discount unearthly or paranormal causes as being the reason why the lady of the house was experiencing electrical oscillations upon her fingering her own apparatus in the drawing room, as I shall now account for. Twatson, the solution I fear lies in the very attic space above our heads. One of us will have to take a unilized lantern into this most unholy and gloomy of spaces to investigate the lack of earthing to the switching brassware. It's an unenviable task, old man, and I suggest we draw matchsticks to decide upon whom it must be that crawls among the cobwebs and bat droppings. Fuck off. Very well put, sir. I admire the courage of your convictions, Twatson, and I see that once again it befalls upon me to undertake the investigative elements of the case. Perhaps it is well, for I am already armed with sufficient purses of barium bisulfate to ward off rodent or insect. And also upon my tool belt is my TIS-859 voltage indicating instrument, which I suspect will be key to the very unmasking of the villainy that has befallen upon the 6 ampere lighting circuit serving this dwelling. Upon entering the attic, a junction arrangement of such evil amateurness was thus uncovered, concealed as it was only by a yoghurt pot, the plastic material of which proving wholly inadequate to provide any kind of enclosure or protection, and the installation being, I deduce, by none other than whom the times itself would byline as a proper fucktard, lacking in the requisite knowledge or skill in the science of electrotechnicalism. Beneath the yoghurt pot covering, it was observed that copper wires numbering three contained within a single sheath ran from the electrical junction to the switching apparatus of the drawing room. The first wire was none other than a circuit protective conductor, or, to use an outdated nomenclature, the earth wire, connected as it was to the brassware of the switching apparatus. Secondly, there was the permanent line, a constantly energised conductor connected to the common terminal of the switch. The third wire was evidently a switched line. A conductor terminated at the L1 output terminal of the switch and thus only energised when the switch was so engaged in the on position. The connection to the luminaire of this conductor thus delivering a supply of electromotive locomotion sufficient to excite the illuminance of the tungsten lamp. It turns the light bulb on? Quite right, Twatson. Is that not what I just said? As already stated, these conductors were housed within a common exterior sheath, with the function of the protective conductor being to root current from the decorative switching brassware to our Mother Earth in the event of a fault, thus saving any unfortunate soul from a shock to the heart should they find themselves in touch contact with the enlivened metalwork. A shock no less so potentially severe that a restorative such as even a brandy may be powerless to reverse, perhaps resulting in the untimely expiration of the unfortunate victim. These wires all traversed the attic within their cable and so into the yoghurt pot junction. However, my TIS-859 voltage indicating instrument revealed to me that the circuit protective conductor serving the switch was improperly connected at the junction point. Twatson, it seems whoever installed this mess has been responsible for leaving it in a wholly dangerous and unsatisfactory state. The deuce! The very same, old man. Tis naught but the devil himself to answer for this fucking effort. 
So the earth was connected at the switch, not at the junction then? Hark at you, Twatson, for you are correct. The protective conductor was indeed connected at the brass switching plate, but not at the electrical junction at the opposite end. I witnessed in another videogram broadcast on this very YouTube a dashing fellow, albeit with vomitus down his shirt front, describe how the electrical field surrounding a live conductor, even one not carrying a current, could induce a voltage through capacitance of any adjacent conductors. Thus, the permanent line here induced a voltage onto the circuit protective conductor running in parallel to it. Therefore, that voltage also appeared on the brass faceplate this protective conductor was connected to. When the good lady of the house then proceeded to touch said brassware for the purpose of adjusting the requisite luminosity, a small current passed from the switchplate through her and to earth, hence the shock sensation so experienced. Incredible, old man. But, in that event, how is it that the RCD did not actuate, as I surely observed one, to be present at the very origin of this circuit? I'm glad you asked that, Twatson, for you see, I deduced you would, as you're completely predictable. The induced current was in the magnitude of microamps, yet it takes 20 to 30 milliamps to spring an RCD installed for additional protection. Therefore, the current was never enough to be a bodily danger to our client, but twas of sufficient magnitude that she should feel the discomfort of it across her tits. All is well now that the circuit protective conductor has been reconnected to Earth at the junction, as this rogue capacitive voltage is now immediately nulled to ground and is a danger nor discomfort no more. Let this be a lesson to us all on the importance of always connecting the circuit protective conductor to maintain continuity to ground. Come now, Twatson, let us hail a carriage and repair to Greg Street. You mean Baker Street? No, my good man, there's only one baker in town and I happen to have a buy one, get one free voucher for one of their fine steak bakes. Fuck you now. Indubitably, Twatson. You old whoosh.